So it's great to have you here with us, Davida. And where I like to start these conversations is just to ask, what first sparked your interest in the principles behind Clarity? Hi, Jamie. Um, so I have always been looking towards um, exploring my, myself. And so I've always been open to that field of getting counseling and therapy. Um, and at the time I was an engineer. Well, actually first I was an engineer and then I realized that that wasn't for me. So I left engineering and um, pursued a counseling career and got my master's in counseling and started counseling. And that was when I first heard about coaching. And I went to um, a conference and someone there, one of the presenters actually mentioned Michael Neal's book, The Inside Out Revolution. So that was 2013. So that was the first time oh, wow. I'd ever heard about the principles. Um, and then at the time, I thought it was just another theory. I thought it was like CBT. So I was like, oh, I'm doing this already. Yeah, I knew it was all about thought. So I was, you know, just doing that a little bit more with my clients at the time. And then about a year later, um, something just sparked inside of me. I don't even know what happened. I just remember where I was in my house at the time. And I was like, wait a minute, this is not a theory. This is something else. This is something about life. So then I was like, I need to learn more. And so in researching it, that's how I came across you. And, um, and just trying to figure out what I wanted, you know, where I wanted to go to learn. And then that led me to you that led me to clarity and to here. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here in this conversation and you and I, so you and I have known each other, gosh, probably four years, five years, something like that. Five. Uh, I think I did glass swing in 2015. Yeah. So five years. What a, what a ride. Yeah. And, and they, the I reached out to you maybe three weeks ago, two three weeks ago, in the uh, in the kind of the aftermath of uh, the killing of George Floyd, and then the everything that was kicking off in the U.S. and and you and I jumped a call and what, uh, jumped on a call, and what I said to you was, uh, to some degree, I was kind of like, well, we're in the U.K., that's a U.S. thing that's going on, and then I thought, well, actually, that it seems like first of all. I'm, I have a global audience. So I kind of thought, well, actually, I'm, I'm, it's an area that I'm kind of ignorant of. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, who do I know who's almost certainly not going to be ignorant of this? And I thought, well, Davida, Davida, what? Davida, <laughs> Davida, she'll be the opposite of that. So, uh, so I reached out to you and you very um, graciously offered to, uh, to come on a call. And, and you and I, be, you know, I put up a post uh, on Facebook and said, who's interested in this? And huge amount of interest. And I, I kind of felt like the way for us to, to kind of proceed would be to just get on a, a call and kind of get to the heart of the matter or see if we can, you know, get to the truth of the matter and, and find out, you know, what's going on from your perspective and, and what we can discover that's going to be, um, uh, enlightening, informative, uh, and so on to people. So I guess, I guess my first question would be, you know, what's going on for you right now? <sighs> um, well, <clears throat> well, I will first say that I don't know everything, <laughs> but I will take that compliment from you and also the compliment of being invited on. So I thank you. Um, and yeah, you know, it's been a roller coaster of emotions, but not a new roller coaster of emotions, if that makes sense. Mm. Because being, I've been exposed to racism for a long time. So it's not new for me, but I know it's that waking up to it is new for a lot of people. Well, and just for people who are listening, where, where do you live? And cause I know you've got uh, young children and everything. Can you tell people a little bit about your, your, your circumstances and situation? Yeah, sure. So I, right now I live in Ohio in the United States. I have a husband and we have four kids. Four, uh, almost young kids, 
So they are 14, 12, 10, and 8. Mm -hmm. um, and we, my husband and I have been married for 18 years. <laughs> nice. Um, and so I am originally from um, Virginia. And um, yeah. So I'm sorry. The original question. Yeah, yeah well, so I was asking you what's going on and you and yes. the thing that the thing that had me ask you about where you are where you're at in your situation is because you, you kind of said I'm no stranger to racism. I've experienced oh, well, my gosh. Yeah, because, well, I think, you know, in case someone is going to be listening to it and not looking at a video, I, I'm black. Um, and yeah, so my. I mean. You know, growing up, you hear things, of course. You hear adults talking about it who experienced it. I saw the pictures in our house of signs over water fountains saying white only. You know, my mom would tell me her stories about growing up and having schools be segregated, though by the time she was in school or in school, you know, the law was changed saying that integration was the law, but it wasn't mandated you know school they still were doing what they wanted to do so she went to school with all black students they sent the black kids to one school and the white kids to another school so i grew up with that mm -hmm. and then i remember my i can't say it's my first but i would just say it's my first memory of experiencing it you know myself was maybe i think eighth grade and at the time the classes the class um was split in the math group was split into advanced math and then not advanced math, I guess. And then if you were in the advanced math, they put you in the advanced um, English class as well, a, liter a language arts class. And I just remember one time I was in the advanced math class, the only black student in that class. All the other black kids in my class were in the other math class. And then um, we had to get a new book. And I noticed the teacher gave one book to all the kids that were in the advanced math class and then a different in reading a book, I don't even remember what book was, novel or whatever, to all the kids in the other, the regular math class. And she gave me one of those books. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, why? And I, cause by that time I figured it out. I was like, wait a minute, all the kids in the advanced math, my math class got this one book and all the kids in the other class didn't. And I was like, what's going on here? And so I asked her about it. I was like, why did they get that book? Is it because they're in that math class? And she was like, yes. And I was like, well, I'm in that class too. She was like, oh. I mean, I don't remember much about that. I do remember that she then gave me, switched me to that reading group. Right. Um, I mean, then there's little stuff, you know, going into places and not getting acknowledge you know, but here but then seeing white people be acknowledged i mean it happens a lot mm -hmm. all the time it's still happening um and so then when mr floyd was killed it was just like it was hard it was hard to see it even though it wasn't surprising I mean, it was hard to see, but it wasn't surprising that that would happen because I just know that, unfortunately, racism and let's get more specific, specifically um, systemic racism is just alive in this world and heavy in our, in our country. Um, and I was really happy to see so many more people waking up and just saying and just acknowledging it and then just showing signs of solidarity and wanting to know more and just so that has been encouraging. But, and Davida, for, yeah. for someone who's listening and who, because everything you described up until you mentioned George Floyd sounded like uh, good old fashioned racism, like not acknowledging, not acknowledging you or the, like a whites only sign or that yeah. sort of thing. Systemic, that, does, that sounds like regular, kind of what we might call one-on-one -on -one racism. Uh, whereas systemic mm -hmm. racism is a, it's a, it's kind of a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Well, kind of, sort of, but Merriam-Webster has just updated their, their uh, definition. Yeah, I heard that. 
So I to in that. include that. So it's, you know, it's when it, how it has affected the policies, the laws that, that govern. They mm -hmm. were built to oppress everyone else but white people in this country. Yeah. I mean, you can look at the history and all the books. I mean, I mean the, the records. So, yeah. And, you know, it's more than just, discrimination and prejudice. It's just the whole system, just how things are just being built to mm. just be so unequal. Mm. Yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, well, and I, I guess the, the thing that's occurring to you, so you said that since, uh, since the death of George Floyd, lots, lots yeah. more awareness, but you also said it's been really hard. What is it for you that's been, I mean, obviously the video yeah. itself was, horrendous to see uh but the impression i got when you said that it's been hard was that there have been other things for you that have been hard oh, about it. yeah just now and then also hearing of the of the many 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 other instances where people have been killed mm -hmm. just because of misunderstanding and fear i mean more from years ago that you know, weren't on my radar because they didn't make the news until now. Mm -hmm. um, like I Elijah McClain in Colorado, up into his last breath, he was being so polite mm -hmm. to the officers and they still killed him. I cried, when I heard about that, I cried for two days. So it, ju it just hurts that that is happening. Um, I, I feel, um, my fear has increased, even though I am aware of how our human experience is created. I still have fears. I mean, I get scared sometimes to let my kids go out by themselves, mm -hmm. you know, but in, in our neighborhood, I, but I realize I can't keep them, you know, bound in the house. Um, so I have to let them go, but I'm praying like all the time. And I remember recently, like right, right you know, when in the height of all of this, my husband was ran, and even my husband, he's out, I get scared. I'm like, Oh my gosh, will he come back, you know, home? He was out for a run. And then when he finished his run, he just FaceTimed me just to chat while he was walking home. And I'm like, in the, looking in the background, scanning it, mm -hmm. trying to make sure that, you know, he's safe. So, and I can imagine for a lot of people listening, that's, that's almost unthinkable to them that like that, that, uh, you know, your kids going out to play or your husband going out for a run, that, that, that they could experience that as a kind of a life-threatening situation. And that's, uh, yeah. yeah, that, that must And has that been different since the George Floyd thing? Better, I, worse, the same? It, it's been worse. I mean, it's always been on my radar, for sure. Mm. But since, yeah, but recently it's just been more intense. Got it. A lot more reminding myself of where our experience really comes from. <laughs> right. But, and, and yeah, yeah. You know, and just wondering, you know, how my kids will handle things, you know, when they're out alone and having more of the talk, you know, having to tell them, you know, what might happen if, you know, you know, and instructions for, you know, we get pulled over by police, you know, you know, using your manners. I mean, but this is, again, it's not new. Mm. Not new. I've had talks with my kids since they were young. I remember my son is 10 now when he was six, I think. So first grade. And um, we were in Florida, living in Florida at the time. And uh, there had been a police shooting here in Ohio and Cincinnati mm. and of Mr. Um, Sam du du Bois, And I was looking at, my son was homesick from school that day. And so it was just, he and I were sitting on the couch watching TV and I was watching a press conference um, and Sam's family was, was talking and my son asked what happened. So I explained to him how he had gotten shot by a police officer and I, and I had to, you know, and then my son, um, and, and, and I think I probably told him, yeah, he got shot by a police officer because he was black. And my son then looked at me and said, will they shoot me too? Mm -hmm. So 
you know, we had to have that conversation about using your manners if you encounter a police officer and how, you know, no, you know, not all police officers act that way, but you know, well, things like that. And that's when he was six. I was, he was six. Yeah. That was four years ago. That's rough. Yeah. I mean, no mother should have to have their child ask, will they be shot by a police officer? Mm -hmm. So, so what's your sense as, as kind of, uh, cause I know when I first reached out to you, one of the things you had said to me that as a, as a, someone who's interested in the principles and has, has spent a bunch of time deepening yeah. your understanding and sharing it and is part of this community, you felt kind of isolated, uh, and, um, pissed off, I think. <laughs> I, I'm, that is I, fair. Am I, reveal, am I revealing a confidence? No, okay. no, that is completely fair. That's completely fair. Um, yeah, I mean, but to be honest, I had been feeling that for a while anyway. And then once um, after Mr. Floyd was killed, and of course, you know, now the heightened awareness, it was just glaringly obvious of the lack of... Uh, positioning in the 3P community. I think I can count on both hands. I don't even know if I need both hands to count the people who I am quote unquote friends with on Facebook, who at least just, who made just some acknowledgement, some post of acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, um, yeah, so it was, it was just hard from that, that perspective. And then, um, the lack of presence, I would say, of people who know, who of non-white people who know about the principles who are in the community, especially in like, I don't know if I even know. I mean, I, I'm starting to see more people of color outside of the states. I would love to meet more in the states who are in the principles yeah. community. Um, now, granted, I will say, I don't spend as much time online. So, I, I mean, to be fair, I'll put that out there. I don't spend that as much time online um because i've got my family and i'm also you know uh, i coach part-time and i'm a part and i teach too and everything so i've got a lot going on so i don't spend as much time online but i would love to connect with more but yeah that i have felt i felt um yeah it has been feeling kind of lonely and you know i i don't think the answer is just to get the principles out to more people of color that's that's not that is yeah i mean of course that is needed, but that's not the answer. The, you know, it, we have to touch on these issues that come up in our lived experiences, that, that absence. Now, what does that, what does that mean to Vita? To someone who's listening and goes, I, uh, yes, of course, we need to get it out to uh, people of color, but mm -hmm. what you said about we need to touch on uh, these things that come up in our lived experience, and someone's like, what do, yeah. you, what do you mean? Okay, so I think it would, the initial thought, and it was actually in the thread that you put up, um, was Allie, Duffy, mm. who touched on it. So the answer isn't just to get the principles out to, um, BIPOC, Black and Indigenous People of Color. Um, yeah, we need to get it out to everybody for sure, but, yeah. we, but that's not the answer, you know, because really racism is not a Black problem. Mm. I wish I could remember Richard Wright's quote when somebody asked him uh, years ago if he, you know, had a problem with these. I know it's not, it's not our problem. It's not. So we've got to, we got to deal with it and 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 white people oh what do you think that what is what does that mean to vita in terms of like someone who's listening to this and yeah. i mean you can you can you can use me as the test case someone who's yeah. listening to this and goes well i'm a i'm aware and i'm by the way i'm not saying uh it's your job to educate anyone it's more right. more understanding more understanding what your perspective on it is. Yeah, like, so instead of getting the word, the principles out to, to you know, BIPOC as the answer, mm -hmm. like, if we can just help more of them see it, then that will get rid of racism. No, that's, that's really, in my opinion, that's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to do it. We, we need to deal with it. Like, 
It can't just fall on, 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 on us. Well, I'm pointing to myself. So, you know, black people and people of color knowing the principles and that's going to make everything okay. Sure. We've got to deal with, okay, well, everyone has racist thoughts. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. So we need to deal with it from that universal perspective versus, okay, well, if we can just go and get it into them, to get it to them, because that's more, that does come from fixing. Like there's something wrong with us. We need to be fixed. Yeah. It strikes me. There's, there's a couple of different things going on. One is the, just the fact that there seems to, that the principles community is a, a predominantly white community. Yeah. Uh, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then there's a, there's a, there's a question which is, okay, how could we, uh, how can we share this understanding with more people of every race, color, and creed? But then there's also a question, which is, what is it about the community as it currently exists mm -hmm. that is, uh, I don't know, perhaps unwelcoming or off-put? And it, it may be literally sheer, sheer I, I don't know if this is a dreadful thing to say, but it may be sheer force of numbers. Like if, if a black person walks up to a group of, you know, 5,000 white people, they're not going to feel particularly, not necessarily going to feel particularly welcomed or included or that sort of thing. So what's. Oh, I don't know. I mean, hmm, I'm wondering, I mean, cause I heard about it. So I don't know. Maybe, I mean, I think it's access for sure. Mm-hmm access is one thing um and that's really hard for me to say too because on the one hand it's like statistically in our country black people earn less than white people mm. and that's part of the systemic racism mm. um so a lot of people may not be able to afford programs even if they did hear about them and then that's just hard for me to say because I, it, I think I'm not trying to paint, you know, I don't want to, to look like black people are in this bad light. Like we don't like, uh, you know, like we don't have anything, but if you look at the numbers. Yeah. It's pretty much a matter of public record, isn't it? That do it. Yeah. You know, all kinds of uh, policies from redlining to. Exactly. Uh, yes. That, that the levels of wealth among the black community. Uh, yeah in the U.S. or significant. And maybe we should talk about that, just explain what that means. Yeah, so go for it. Know what, what redlining is, and I mean, I'll just explain it as best as I know, but it comes with the, um, the housing laws that were put into a, to effect, basically, and it just moved people into certain neighborhoods, and people of color ended up being moved into some of the worst areas to live and it has to go with the mortgage in the bank. I mean, you know what, if anybody wants, just Google redlining mm -hmm. and you'll, and you'll figure out, but that is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've, I've been, I've been, uh, since I put up the post saying that I was going to be having this conversation, I've been doing a kind of uh, crash yeah. course on, uh, on um, Th that kind of thing. And there are so many different threads to so yeah. like mortgages, like the red line. If you lived on certain, like the red line, you couldn't get a mortgage. Yeah. 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 So it was like keeping people from housing and just, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so, so one thing is just access. Yeah. Just access. And I guess there may also be like, like with anything, with anything like this, I, kn I know when I first came to the principles, it was, it tended to be presented in a way that was only going to appeal to a very narrow band of people. Yeah. Only, and, and so there may also be something about the, uh, the kind of, um, kind of the look and feel and everything of how it's promoted and shared and that sort I of thing. I think it is. And also I think it is promoted to, to people who want to be coaches. Yeah. I mean, too and not everybody wants to be a coach so i think that takes us back to looking at lived experiences too you know looking at the principles through in 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 relation to our lived experiences i mean 
I think there's been so much focus on the fact that our experience is created through thought that, but not acknowledging the fact that that does not mean that our lived experience is not valid. Yeah. Well, that let's clear that up for people who are listening because I was, I was having a conversation funnily enough with one of my, my clients who, who's, uh, had a lot of experience of racism and oppression and that sort of thing. And, and she said, you know, it's hard for me to think that this is just my thinking. I'm like, hang on a second. There are terrible things that happen to people in this world. And, and th this understanding isn't about saying, oh, just think about it differently or something like that. Like there, these are real experiences and, uh, they, the the promise of the principles isn't that uh, that nothing hurts or that nothing uh, or that you that if you just think about it right nothing's a problem like there's some stuff that uh, it's quite right to get pissed off about that it's quite right to yeah uh, to have to put your foot down about like no doubt about it um, go on no I was just gonna say yeah I mean you were probably one of the first people that I heard at least acknowledge that in some way. And that's why I went ahead and signed up with Glasswing because when I first heard about the principles, it was don't do nothing. I mean, not, not, not don't do, but do, uh, you don't have to do anything. What's the phrase? Um, do nothing. Whatever was like a big thing, right? Because yeah, really because we're guided by life, it's just um, listening to that and it will tell us what to do, but it did come off as, you don't have to do anything. So yeah. I think that's been taken probably too literally. And, but anyway, but acknowledging lived experiences versus trying, just excusing them as like you were saying, just because of, well, you know, it's all about your thought and, and thinking, you know, if you have a cut and you need stitches and you're hurting, the pain is obviously coming through thought. We know that, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to take you to get stitches. Yeah, right. Right, and th and there's definitely there's that most. It's almost never a good time to say to someone, you know, it's just your thinking, right? Like it's exactly almost never a good to say that. Exactly, and I actually had a conversation around kind of similar to that with my kids. We were watching the news, and they were covering the protest, and you know, just telling, you know, my kids, like, because they are starting I, to understand a little bit more. And so I told them, I was like, yeah, we know, know what's going on. It's all misunderstanding. And maybe we should clear what that means. But I was like, this is not the time to be trying to say, because people are hurting. Yeah. This is a time for people to listen to those hurts, to acknowledge that, to say, I see you, I hear you, I feel you versus well, you shouldn't be looting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What? Are you serious? You, you can't tell somebody how to carry their pain. I mean, tell, you know, you can, but that's not how they're not going to hear you. And that, I think that's part of the thing. We, if you can't, you got to, you have to care. And I think that care, that feeling of caring about our, but like lived experiences is missing in the community. So, oh, that's really, that's very, I, I haven't heard that before. Tell me more about that. I mean, having more discussions around the things that people live in life would be helpful in the community. Mm. You know, get, finding out, okay, what are people going through? and maybe doing just doing things up i mean it's just it's all this the focus has just been on thought mm -hmm. and thought is creating your experience and for so many people i mean and like that's just the blanket answer and technically that's right but it just would be awesome just to know that just to, you know, to remind people, yeah, you're, what you're going through is real. Yeah. It's not just in your head, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I don't, I don't know. 
I mean, just to know that, you know, the officer that had his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck was definitely in some major misunderstanding about who he is and about, you know, how his experience was being created because that's why his knee was on that man's neck. Mm. So because he couldn't see who he really is as a part of the oneness that is this energy that's life, he couldn't see that George Floyd is a part of it too. But he was disconnected from his compassion and, and from his humanity, really, as far, as, as, far as I can tell, or at the very yeah. least, his common sense. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so was it just his thinking that, you know, was it his thinking that did it? Yeah. I mean, it was his, it was because of, of, of thought, but you have to, it's just so much more than that, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I love the words aren't coming to me, but. I think you're wording good. You know, it, it just would be nice to have just, let's just touch on some other things versus how can you, you know, I think how to share it is, is, is a blanket thing too. You know, maybe getting some more specific, we just need to get more specific, I guess, more, I don't know. No. I mean, my, my take on it, Davida, is if you, if you want to share this understanding with someone, if you want to tell them that it's their thinking for that matter, you earn the right to do that by finding out about their world and finding out about how they see it. And in my opinion, until the person that I'm speaking with or, and listening to, uh, until they feel that I get them, and that I get what's going on for them and that I, that I'm mm -hmm. actually see them and I'm listening and that I care. And that until, until I, until they, until they have that experience, I haven't earned the right to tell them a damn thing. That's it. That's it. And I think that's what's missing. Yeah. That wanting to listen and get people's experiences before telling them. Mm. that it's about, you know, their thinking. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So as, as we're talking about the principles, are there things that you've learned uh, and seen about this understanding that have been useful to you over the last six weeks? Yeah. Yeah, I will say if I did not have this, if I was not awakened to this understanding, I would be handling this mm -hmm. a lot differently. I remember when Rodney King, uh, the Rodney King beating happened in, what year was that, 92 maybe? Yeah. Um, I was in ninth grade or 10th grade. And I just remember somehow the news came out while we were in school or maybe it was the next day after and all the kids were all upset and wanting, and some of them were rather, I shouldn't say all, some, most black kids, and they wanted to walk out. And I just remember wanting to walk out, but I was too afraid of my mama. So I was like, <laughs> I can't do that. But, you know, but yeah, I felt it. I was like, you know, mad and angry. And I think if I didn't have the understanding of, of, how, of who we really are and how our experience is created, yeah, I would probably be not handling this well mm. at all. Not, not at all. And it has helped me to see even more so. Um, well, what I would say it has just, it hasn't unconvinced me if that's the word oh, i'm making up new words it hasn't unconvinced me of our oneness that's cool to hear yeah i mean the way it looks to me it's like you know when you shine light 
through a prism. To me, that is God. That is the energy, the intelligence, the wisdom behind life, the thing that is everything. And when you shine that light through it, how it shows up in different colors, but it's still the same light. So it hasn't changed my understanding of that. I still know that that's how it, how it is. Um, yeah, it's helped me to know even more about you need to listen to people and understand where they're coming from. So even if I was to, you know, talk to someone who sees things different from me, I understand a little bit more now about, okay, let me listen and understand where they're coming from before I try to jump in and try to tell them something mm -hmm. or how things are different or whatever. You, you know, I mean, it's like the sky is blue, but if you try to tell me the sky is purple, I don't, why do I need to jump in and try to convince you that the sky is blue? I can just listen to you because I know the sky is blue. Yeah. But, but yeah, so it's helped me with that. It's helped me to see, I don't know, that might not have been a good example, but it, it has helped me to be more aware that I need to practice listening more. Um, and it has helped me to see that racism is not who is not right. Being a racist, racist is not who a person is. Mm. It speaks more to their thinking. That's all. Got so it. I recognize that for some people, they take that on as that's like, um, like saying that's something about who they are. I don't see it that way anymore. I used, I probably, yeah, I used to, but I don't see it that way anymore. To me, it's just a type of thinking that we everybody has that's interesting so you the the because the you know he is a racist is kind of an identity level thing whereas there's something about well if i was thinking what that guy's thinking then so i don't see it like that anymore yeah right. I, I wouldn't call somebody a racist I would just say they have racist thinking, yeah, you know, cool. and, and I think some people, I think that's another thing. People take that on as a, as an identity. Right. And so then, then there may feel some associated things like shame or mm -hmm. guilt, whatever. And then that might block them from being open to learning even and discovering more, you know, too. So I think we need to, we have to deal with that. We need to help people to see that, that you're, it's not, a, it's not, um, it doesn't speak to your, your identity, it's separating that. When did that shift for you? When did you start to see that differently? When, just lately, when, I mean, af, you know, after Mr. Floyd's stuff and thinking about everything and just being willing and open mm -hmm. to um, see things differently. Yeah. Rather than just seeing them through my anger. Yeah, which you could be, uh, would be totally understandable if you were just seeing it through your anger as well. Oh yeah. 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 So, um, I don't know. I think that's a big thing too. Just suffering that. And what else? Hmm. I don't know. Well, I, I was wondering something actually, because as well as being a coach, you've spent yeah. uh, a bunch of time in the, uh, the educational system. Yeah. And one of the questions we had was from Rose, who was asking, oh, let me just find it. She asked, okay. what one thing can we do to improve the school uh, education curriculum? What one key thing would have the most impact? Do you have a, a perspective on that? Yeah. Um, I thought it was a great question. I would say changing the curriculum is definitely important. And I'll come back to that. But that is not the end all be all and might not even be the first step. Mm -hmm. You've got to deal with the teachers because student success is completely driven by, I would say, teacher well-being and teacher, yeah, the teacher well-being and them, like the quality, um, because you can have the best curriculum in the world, but if it's being taught by teachers who have, who, um,
don't have the, I don't know how to explain it, the, the heart, it's not going to matter. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I, the, we, did a, uh, we did a workshop a couple of years ago um, called uh, Resolving the Roots of Youth Violence. And so it was a group of youth workers mm-hmm. who were working with kids who were gang members and excluded from school and pretty, pretty troubled kids. And we were thinking, what's the, if we could give the youth workers anything, what would we want to give them? And the answer we got to was we would love for them to see the, the uh, innate capacity for resilience and well-being and uh, realization that the kids had. The, the, the young yeah. people. Yeah. If they because if the youth workers could see that, it would just change the game. But we also knew the only way they were going to be able to see that for the kids is by seeing it for themselves. Yeah. So that that's, was the starting point. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. And because even if the curriculum isn't the best, if that teacher has had that heart change, then they'll see things that, oh, hmm, maybe I'm going to do this differently. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like they'll have, they'll hear their wisdom telling them what to do. Yeah. Um, but I mean, curriculums absolutely do need to be changed because as the way they are right now, there's at least here in our country, I'll speak to it most times, they are set up to reinforce racism, you know? Oh, in what ways? Like history, mm. history, black history is like a separate course in right. most schools. It's not integrated, you know? And so what does that say? Mm. So then it says that your history is an art, or it's not a shared history. Yeah. So you know, can, all those implications. So even though segregation is over, history is still segregated. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, most schools, if you want to learn about black history, you have to take a different course than the regular mm-hmm. history class. I mean, right. That's just one, one, one example. I mean, yeah. So Davida, you know, for people who are listening to this, who want to, uh, to understand uh, more and who want to who want to deal with you know whatever their own uh, you know I'm reminded of I'm reminded of a quote that I can't quite remember but it, it goes something like don't seek for love instead seek for the barriers you have built against it in your own heart and I kind of I feel I I kind of my sense is that there's something like that that it's the it's it's about go on yeah yeah because love is there it's never absent Mm. just like as I've learned from you the experience of it comes and goes so yeah the question is not well, how can I love more really, I guess, but well, what's blocking it? Mm-hmm. Because it's always there. It's just something is there blocking it. So that's, that is the exploration. What is there? What is in the way? And helping people to see that. Cause I, I, I think that's the thing. So many people don't understand it, that love is our core essence. And that whenever we don't feel it, there's always, because there's something there in the way, some thought that's there. And if we could just be open to examining it, not analyzing, we don't have to analyze our thoughts, but just examining and then challenging. I have to do it with my kids all the time. I love my kids. So trying to, like if my daughter, you know, misbehaves and I get all upset about it, which I do frequently. I've learned now that, cause I used to get up so mad at myself. Like I love her. Why am I getting so mad at her or bother? Her? How can I love her even, or, you know? And I realized instead of trying to use my willpower and love her even more or whatever, looking at well, what's in the way, why am I upset? It's always because of fear. Cause I'm thinking that I'm afraid of whatever. It's, it's always fear, in, in, my, in my opinion. I'm afraid of 
that she'll never stop that behavior or I'm afraid of if she break if they break something then I'm not gonna have the money to replace it or whatever and when I can um catch that it's been a lot easier to return back to to peace that's been a, a lot easier than me trying to stop myself out of willpower to stop yelling at them when I can see my blocks what is blocking and so I think it's the same thing in, in racism if you can allow yourself to see what is blocking you from treating other people with love and kindness versus trying to make yourself to do it mm. it's just there yeah, there's just it's a block it's a block there and so i think as much as we have to deal with the physical things like you know laws and you know, yeah, there have to be consequences for actions for sure. But we also have to deal with the spiritual side, you know, as well. And to me, I say spiritual, for me, that means the non-physical. Mm. As in seeing our true nature, you know, as a part of the intelligence behind life everybody is and if we can see that and really understand that then yeah the only question is okay when we when we get bothered or upset okay so then well what's in the way of me seeing them as another expression of the intelligence behind life yeah my the, the way i sometimes Say as I paraphrase Tila Der Chardin, I, I say we're not we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're one spiritual being having seven billion human experiences. And when I, I heard you say that, that touched me because that is it. And then it's not seeing that. Yeah. That's the issue. And we all sometimes don't see that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see it all the time, <laughs> but it's pretty cool when I can catch and I catch myself versus yeah, just staying yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I could, if I, if we could get out any message, it would be that in my, for me. Mm. Well, that sounds like a message worth getting out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Davida, where can people, if people want to find out more about you and what you're doing or they want to get in touch, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Um, you can go to my website, um, D-A-V-I-D-A-I-A-R-N-O-L-D, Davida I Arnold .com. Um, Or you can reach me across social media all of my handles are the same at Davida I Arnold. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I encourage people to reach out to you and uh, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thanks Davida. <laughs>